قلبي على جمعة الخير هلا حني قلبي على جمعة الخير هلا يا هلا ويا هلا ويا هلا ويا هلا يا هلا ويا هلا ويا Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another edition of uh, Let's Talk this Wednesday morning with me, Julie Ali, on ITV, coming to you live from Sunny Hill in Johannesburg. And as always, we have some interesting women in studio. It is Women's Month. And of course, we're going to be enjoying a wonderful public holiday tomorrow all in honor of you and I as women. So let us just kick back, relax and indulge. It's our day, so let's make the most of it. But for now, we're going to talk to three amazing women. We're going to be talking uh, the great African read. We're also going to be looking at the Sophie Kanza Foundation. It's all about women and what they're doing to uplift communities. And we're going to be looking at regenerative medicine and stem cell therapy with the gorgeous Dr. Ava Siolo. Salaamu Alaikum. Welcome to the studio. Lovely to have you here once again. I spoke to you about a year ago. Am I right? Yes. So I know that you've been traveling all around the world. Um, you are very keenly interested in regenerative medicine and stem cell therapy. You are a qualified plastic and reconstructive surgeon. So why the interest in stem cell therapy? It's a very new um, discipline of medicine and um, it uses your own body potential to regenerate, to heal um, your own body. Um, with that, I think it's very sort of a futuristic type of uh, medicine and uh, um, we're hoping that we will be replacing slowly the traditional treatments uh, which are um, mainly pharmacological, pharmaceuticals, um, to um, use your own body to heal. So that would be obviously regenerative medicine. Yes. And this is via stem cell therapy. Now you're a, um, obviously a plastic and reconstructive surgeon. This would be of keen interest in your discipline of work. Yes. Explain it. Everybody thinks it's much more into the um, embryo, um, much more to the hematology, um, much more to the bone marrow, right? So why plastic surgery? Um, stem cells as such, uh, they are cells which are having um, a regenerative potential. They've got a potential to form any other tissue if they direct it the right way by your own body or in the lab by certain um, substances. So basically um, we, um, we getting uh, into the stage when um, when having uh, when we when we sort of a uh, sorry I lost the the plot. <laughs> <laughs> Not Sorry. to worry. You're trying to explain how stem cell therapy works in regenerating um, tissue and possibly in the future yes, body yes, parts, yes. limbs. I, I know, I know, yes, yes. Now I know, <laughs> I know. I was trying to tell why actually plastic surgery is right. involved. The link. Right, yes, the link, the link. I lost the plot. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm Don't sorry. apologize. We're back on track. <laughs> so plastic surgeons are basically involved in that because um, stem cells are apart from uh, being um, present in the um, umbilical cord or uh, bone marrow they are also present in fat and as we all know plastic surgeons are very involved in taking the fat out or putting the fat somewhere else um, in the um, cosmetic procedures um, so we seems to be quite uh, qualified to get the fat out from the right places, process it and extract the stem cells as such and use them into the further therapies. Now, you're talking um, fat 
um, you're talking stem cells from the fat. I also know that with this type of therapy, stem cell therapy, um, their doctors and scientists then extract the bone marrow, fluid from the bone marrow. That sounds very inf invasive. And you're talking um, stem cells from fat. It's very different. Which would be more effective of the two or perhaps the safer option of the two? Well, I think both are invasive procedures, right? Um, um, to extract bone marrow, you have to go through the cortex of the bone and get inside the bone. So obviously, you um, invasive in that um, terms. Um, Invasive in plastic surgery when you're taking the fat means that you're perforating the skin and um, invasively taking out the fat from your fat, fat layer. Um, obviously but you're just syringing it out. It's basically, yes, it's, uh -huh. it's syringing out. So it's probably less traumatic. Um, it's probably less painful if given local anesthetic. Um, and the main um, reason why we like stem cells from the fat is that uh, they are very readily available. The amount of stem cells in the fat, it's a very, very stable pool. Uh, it doesn't really matter how old you are, you still have stem cells. Um, comparing to the, the bone marrow, when with age, unfortunately, the stem cells count in your bone marrow decreased. Um, so. Um, obviously, it's more convenient for the patient to have. Uh, so the cut of uh, the cut of age for for bone marrow uh, stem cell would be around about the sixties, I should imagine. Well, look, it's already depleting by sixties. Okay. So uh, let's say forties, fifties mm -hmm. is probably getting slowly down um, with the um, fat tissue. Um, you have stable pool of till your 80s. We're going to talk about the type of uh, diseases and injuries that can be healed via stem cell therapy and how successful you know it is and what you're seeing around the world and I do know that you've been traveling very widely um, as far as stem cell therapy is concerned. Share some of that information with us. Um, you need to differentiate the um, work which is done in the laboratories uh, as a research and work which is done already in clinical studies on patients, on live patients. Um, in laboratories, we are very, very advanced with stem cells. Um, we can direct them to uh, form specific organs even, specific tissues. Um, there are bioreactors which uh, can grow little lungs or... Uh, Ooh. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's quite amazing. Limbs, uh, I should uh, imagine. Vessels. Um, uh -huh. So it's, it's very advanced that uh, tissue engineering um, uh, part of, of stem cell therapies. Um, but on the clinical side, um, we already use uh, a lot of stem cells into um, joint therapy, um, healing wounds, um, restoring the normal texture of the scars. And that's, that's only a, a surface. Um, in the labs, uh, we're working on myocardial infarction. What about cancers? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's very controversial. All right. you, you, you touch very controversial um, topic because the stem cells, because they've got potential of multiplying. Um, like they, cancer cells does. Uh, like cancer cells does. We have to be very cautious to okay. di di direct them the right way. Okay, so that's very tricky. So that's tricky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I should imagine lots of research is still undergoing as far as uh, cancers are concerned, stem cell therapy in healing cancers. Yeah, that's that's more on hematology side. Right. Um, yeah, mm. well, in in terms of uh, what I work with, um, we not really touching on the cancer, and there is a little bit of a controversy when it comes to the restoration. Let's say uh, breast um, after the mastectomies for the breast cancer, there is a discussion about. Uh, 
um, if the stem cells uh, injected to the uh, post-operative uh, oncological breast uh, can cause a cancer. So far, we're on a very good track. Uh, stem cells are not causing any damage, but um, it's still controversial. I can't vouch for it. And when you talk to the patient about, um, let's say, um, reconstruction of the breast with their own fat tissue, they need to be aware that there is not enough research to prove 100% that they save 100%. Wow, thanks for your very candid response to that <laughs> question. Let's go for our first ad break. Dr. Eva Siolo is my guest in studio this morning. We're talking stem cell therapy and amazing guest with an amazing um, knowledge. She's done lots of research. She's attended many conferences, seminars, etc., all around the world as far as stem cell therapy is concerned and inshallah right after the ad break we're going to ask some more questions the type of work she's involved in and the possibilities going forward right here in south africa stay with us uh, we'll be doing more talking after the ad break <laughs> السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أهلا وسهلا ومرحبا بكم حياكم الله يا مشايخ Brothers and sisters, the Arabic language all around us. That was the Islamic greeting in the Arabic language. We pray five times a day in the Arabic language, the Quran, the Sunnah in the Arabic language. Many of us had noble intentions to study, but we felt that it's too difficult. It's impossible for me to study the Arabic language. Has the time not come to make an effort? Join us at the course. Keep calm and let's learn Arabic. Yusra Tours, limited time offer. Baghdad and Istanbul tour with Molana Musa Raza from Pretoria. Depart 14th December, return 26th December. Visiting Baghdad, Karbala, Najaf, Kaziman and Istanbul. Over 20 ziyarat places to be visited. For only 28,000 rands, 499 rands per person sharing a double room. Contact us in Pretoria, Johannesburg, Lanesia, Durban and Cape Town or visit www.yusratours.com Build your wealth by utilizing Oasis' range of investment products designed specifically for socially responsible and ethical investors. These regulated products are managed by qualified and experienced professionals who are focused on creating value for you over the long term. Whether you're saving for something specific, wanting to contribute towards your retirement fund, Oasis has a product just for you. Contact your financial advisor or call us directly. Oasis. Commitment unwavering. is behind all the greatest stories of our lives and the greatest love of all is Allah's the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah are the days most loved by Allah so give Qurbani in 30 countries worldwide give Qurbani give love with Islamic relief
We're talking to the gorgeous Dr. Eva Ciolo. She is here about regenerative and stem cell therapy, regenerative medicine and stem cell therapy. We're going to talk about the possibilities um, as far as uh, diseases and conditions are concerned and challenges going forward and how far down the line are we here in South Africa as far as regenerative medicine and stem cell therapy is concerned. Let's start with that question. South Africa is not very far. Um, far behind or forward? Not very far forward, unfortunately, <laughs> yes. Um, I would estimate that we're probably five to ten years behind. Ooh, yes. okay. There is um, uh, not enough research. Um, obviously, our country, in, in terms of the medical problems, will deal with different uh, problems. So the emphasis on the research is on really different problems um, and um, they are unfortunately still the African um, uh, problems, right? Sure. So um, the very advanced research uh, is not uh, there yet. Um, uh, we're far away from, uh, let's put it, uh, um, one very forward country, America. We're not sure. there at all. Um, and we're not um, as far advanced um, in clinical studies as Far East. Um, there are centers, uh, there obviously there are trials, there are um, molecular biology uh, labs where they're trying to deal with the uh, stem cells, um, growth of the tissue, um, regeneration of the tissue. But uh, not coming, not much is coming out as yet from our country, unfortunately. Which means if people watching us this morning can afford to go for any stem cell therapy, uh, they would have to go to America or the Far East. Well, um, there are private uh, practitioners who are offering already uh, stem cell therapy. In South Africa. In South Africa. And that mainly for the joints. Um, um, the, the Is that to regenerate cartilage to, in the joints? To improve the state of the joint. Ah. Um, the cartilage in the joints um, can be damaged to a certain degree, right? Um, so if it's not very advanced level, um, stem cells can help a lot. Um, they can actually, small defects in the cartilage in the joints can be regenerated by, the, by your own stem cells. But the, if the joints are completely worn off, um, there's not really much hope to regenerate cartilage over there. And unfortunately, still the conventional uh, methods of replacing the joints are uh, proceeding in, in those cases. But uh, when you have a cases of osteoarthritis grade one to grade three, um, patients can have a help um, of uh, um, injecting PRPs, which is um, serum from your own blood, extracted from your own blood and containing your own growth factors, which are helping symptoms in early stages of osteoarthritis. Or if the defects, as I mentioned, are small in the cartilage, they can have extracted stem cells from their own tissue and injected into the joints with hope that the symptoms are be uh, much less severe and the cartilage will regenerate. Um, there is a lot of controversies around this. And um, I think um, about a year or two years ago, there was a program on carte blanche when the doctor was uh, misusing the stem cell Ooh. therapy. And that went a little bit um, sort of a backwards um, uh, when it comes to the publicity about the stem cells. Um, but um, it's, it's worldwide now that the joints are um, injected with stem cells. It's all over the Europe, which is allowed to inject and stem cells. And you'll be seeing good results. We're seeing good results. It's been started um, earlier on on animals. Um, veterinar veterinarians, they're using stem cells um, to treat sports injury on horses, to uh, treat osteoarthritis on the dogs. So it's vastly used in um, animal medicine. But um, 
as, as I'm saying, it's still on the verge of controversy. All right, uh, so what else are we seeing um, stem cell therapy working and giving us good results? And I know that it may not be available in South Africa as we speak, but the possibilities are that you could go to the States or elsewhere to get the type of treatment. You spoke a little earlier on about the heart. Uh, you spoke about strokes. This was off air, obviously. So let's share all of that information. I'm thinking people who are on um, regular dialysis, is there a possibility with kidney healing? Um, what other areas um, are we looking at as far as this glimmer of hope that we're giving out to people this morning? <laughs> yes. Look, um, the research, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, the labs are working on um, um, heart attacks, right? The, we know that heart attack is basically an area of the dead cells um, in the heart muscle. Um, so the labs are working on specific patches, which can be um, immediately after the heart attack um, placed on the heart to restore that area to a normal function, to a normal muscle. Um, there is a lot of research which has been done on pigs, um, not on humans as yet. Um, lots of hope in diabetes. Um, there are um, um, scientists who are, are trying to actually grow a pancreas, an organ which is producing insulin. Um, so um, the stem cells from your own body can be injected uh, to you and produce in the pancreas, which is not producing enough insulin, which can, can actually produce the cells which are functional and produce enough insulin and the and in this is all happening currently in the state these uh, therapies are available no not that's yet not, no, this that's is all a still lab, in that's a lab studies right. we the the labs are working on alzheimer even on the spinal cord injuries mm -hmm. it's absolutely amazing it's it's very futuristic it's 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 mind-boggling absolutely but <laughs> what is available what currently is available? i'm thinking people who have some form of a chronic disease or ailment and they've tried absolutely everything and nothing's working this would be their last hope the last glimmer of hope for them if they can afford it so what is it that is available let me put it that way and let me make it more um, easy on our minds that you know this is so much of a future um, everybody who works with fat and injects fat into the areas of disease or damage um, is probably using the it's not probably, it's using the stem cells which are in the fat to regenerate those areas. So when we talking about the burns, about the scars, um, when we introducing the processed fat in the scars, we actually introducing fat cells and the, uh, the stem cells and those stem cells are producing more blood vessels, more collagen. They're restructuring the scar tissue into much more normal tissue. So obviously stem cells take, takes their own sweet time to uh, regenerate. <laughs> it's not immediate. How, how long are we looking at? Oh, you're looking anything from three months to a year to see an improvement on certain to specific see results. areas. But the scars are improving. Okay. Also healing the chronic wounds like mm -hmm. ulcers, like venous ulcers, diabetic ulcers. When we inject fat there or when we inject stem cells there extracted from the fat, we, we, uh, we observing an amazing speeding up process of healing that. Now, we're talking about the patient's own um, fat cells yes. and then you extract the stem cells which you inject back into the area that needs to yes. be healed. Are there any side effects involved here? 
Well, not really. Okay. Um, they um, can be adverse effect of um, surgery per se, uh, meaning that um, if you're taking the fat uh, from a specific area, it's invasive procedure. Um, you can have uh, obviously bruising, swelling, a little bit of a infection. pain there. You can have infection. Mm -hmm. So everything what um, what is connected to the invasive procedure on your body can happen, unfortunately. Also, the fat injected or stem cells injected can cause infection because it's the moment you going through the skin with some different object, you might introduce some sort of an infection there. Mm -hmm. But um, there is no evidence of um, really something going terribly wrong, like forming a cancer in the ulcer or, um, I don't know, degeneration of the joint when you inject it to the joint. The worst um, is if the stem cells are not working, I think. And that does happen from time to time? Well, probably yes, uh -huh. because um, obviously the process of extraction is quite uh, finicky. Um, you have to rely on people who are extracting, uh, extracting stem cells. You have to rely on equipment which they are using. Um, you have to be aware who's doing the procedure for you. Um, you need to know that the lab is an established lab um, with the proper... Um, I need to interrupt you here. We have a minute to wrap up time. Yes. Just one very quick question. What is the s scenario looking like as far as regenerating stem a regeneration of uh, damaged eyes or people who are blind, etc.? There is a research going towards that. Uh, the deafness and the vision um, are um, uh, already sort of advanced uh, studies. Um, a recent uh, meeting which I've been through, a um, little bit of a reluctancy when it comes to the eyes. It might cause a certain uh, type of fibrosis when the stem cells are injected into the eyes because uh, if there are not 100% pure cells um, which are um, located to deal with the eyes, but there are other stem, other stem cells or other cells in that component of injection that might cause of, um, fibrotic changes in the eyes. So it's not really it's there yet. <laughs> yes. That's where we have to leave it. Unfortunately, we need to have you back in studio sometime <laughs> soon to talk some more about this fascinating field of medicine. And that, of course, is um, regenerative medicine and stem and maybe, cell therapy. maybe more confined <laughs> Absolutely. topic. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you for being with us. Thank you and very much. I uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you. That Thanks. was Dr. Eva Ciolo talking to us about um, stem cell therapy. And, of course, we spoke about it a very wide but when we have it in next in studio, we'll hone in on specific body parts and talk about the procedures and the possibilities, not only in South Africa, but around the world. Stay with us. We're going for our second ad break. <laughs> وبعزم كالنهر الجاري نسلك درب العلم ونعمل قبس إصلاح وإخاء علم إيمان Home for 104 orphans, Beitul Halima Orphanage will provide love, care and safety. Earn Sadaqatul Jaria by sponsoring a brick for 20 rand, square meter 6,000 rand. Or one villa for your beloved one for 380,000 rand. For further information, contact our office on 011-026-0009 or on 083 653 -5669. Or you can email us at bhorphanage at webmail.co.za. For all your flexible packaging, snack packaging, candy wrapper, shrink sleeves, labels, cartons, and other custom packaging, contact CPP Flexibles on 072-474-1132 and at www.cppflexibles.co.za. 
Yusuf Waja Insurance Brokers specializes in Sharia compliant savings and investments. We have been committed to fast, friendly and efficient service since 1989. Use our tried and tested relationships to work for you. From savings and investments plans to retirement and pension planning, we have the best solution waiting for you. Now, that's for sure. Join the conversation. Like us on Facebook, ITV Networks. Follow us on Twitter, at ITV underscore SA. Keep up to date with all the programming and subscribe to our YouTube channel, ITV Networks. Aleve Door Manufacturers, the fastest growing timber door manufacturing company in South Africa. We manufacture a large range of quality timber doors at affordable prices. With over 50 years combined experience in the door manufacturing industry, our management team has perfected the art of door manufacturing. Our state-of-the-art factory is situated in Durban and we offer countrywide and cross-border deliveries. For sales inquiries and e-brochure, please email sales at aleve.co.za or call 031-500-2490. A leaf door manufacturers. We did not invent the door, we just perfected it. Khidmatul Awam, South Africa's most trusted and leading Hajj operator, offering the best, most affordable and suitable Hajj packages to suit all your Hajj requirements. With full reduced prices, step-by-step -step Hajj guidance, frontline and five-star hotels in Medina, Makkah, and a unique building in Azizia. We have a full team of committed Khadims and Ulema. Khidmatul Awam will make your Hajj a spiritual experience. You also have the option of adding a couple's room in Azizia or our Aksai add-on to your package. Come into any one of our three regional branches or Contact us nationally on 010-600-5786. Travel with an operator that cares. And welcome back from stem cell therapy. We're also going to be looking at the great African reed. But right now we have a young lady in studio with us. She has started a foundation and she's here to tell us her story. And what better way to be introducing Women's Month and, you know, accolading amazing women that are doing amazing work in the communities. Sophie Kanza or Kanza is one of those women. Morning, welcome to the program. Good morning, thank you for having me. Lovely to have you here and the comment I made just now off air was that, gee was you're young to be running a foundation. So have I got your surname uh, Kanza? Is it Kanza? Yes. Okay. You're 26 years old, you're studying through UNISA, but you started a foundation in conjunction with a friend of yours? With my sister Louise. Your, your sister? Yes. Okay. Um, tell us the story. How did this all start and why is it important for someone as young as yourself mm -hmm. uh, to be putting back, I mean this is service, putting back into the community? Um, it started in 2014, uh, so my sister Louise and I, well our family is from the Democratic Republic of Congo and uh, we came to South Africa as asylum seekers in 1995 and we've been here ever since. Uh, growing up was quite tough. and we, Why? Because my, my mom was not around and my dad um, has bipolar so he was always in and out of uh, institutions so he couldn't really look after us um, as well as he would have liked to so we had to rely on the goodness of others to survive um, where it be food parcels or you know people would take us in when we didn't have a place to stay and it was just the two of us so after matric we decided to start something that could be a way of paying it forward even wow. if it wasn't exactly to the people that helped us but just to pay it forward 
I love the concept of paying it forward. <laughs> Um, it's really about being in service and uh, uplifting the community. Absolutely. Um, you also talk about um, Afrophobia and xenophobia. Yeah. And coming from the Congo yourself, I have no doubt that you were exposed to these type of phobias. Yes. Your experiences and how you're turning it around for other people. Yeah, so the foundation which started as, you know, just a few good deeds later on, really took an activism role because we were upset by the fact that there was no representation of migrants, asylum seeker and refugee youth like us. There were no campaigns that spoke to us, by us. And also, you know, the experiences, a lot of times people don't want to help us just because we were um, foreign. And also, you know, the comments, the insults, the violence that other people faced. Luckily, we didn't. But, I mean, injustice anyway is injustice everywhere. So if our fellow, you know, migrants faced violence, it, it touched us. And also, we really wanted to talk about institutionalized Afrophobia because um, many people didn't know that this existed and they didn't know the intentional barriers that we faced. Talk to us about institutionalized Afrophobia. What exactly are you saying when you say that? For example, an asylum seeker um, person that has... Like yourself? Yes. Would not be able to open a bank account at any bank in South Africa. The country has granted you asylum, but you're not allowed to open up a, a bank account. Yes. So what's the point? How do you exist? <laughs> That's why most people succumb to cheap labor, you right. know, because they they can't open a bank account, so you can't get a you basically can't get a job in the twenty first century without a bank account. Um, luckily, I've been in the country for over twenty years, so I opened an account a very long time ago when they still allowed us to. Um, so I've been able to hold on to that account, but it's been nearly ten years now that they don't allow people to. And um, I spoke to someone at one of the banks, and the reason was that when they get the asylum seeker permits, they need to send it to Home Affairs. Home Affairs needs to verify it's, um, that it's authentic. So Home Affairs can take from seven to 10 months to do this oh. process. So the bank would rather just not allow us to open bank accounts to avoid that um, strenuous process. You're one of the fortunate ones and you were able to open up a bank account and that gives you almost freedom. It's almost a, a permission to live, to exist and to survive. Yeah. What about all of those hundreds of thousands that are here illegally or as asylum seekers who are not allowed to open up bank accounts? How do they survive? And I ask you this question because you interact mm -hmm. with other African nationals on a very daily basis through your foundation. Yes. So they succumb to cheap labor, you know, they do odd jobs where they, they are able to be paid in cash, um, you know, they sell fruits and vegetables on the road, um, some of them do businesses where they buy things over here and send it back home and work with someone back home that can help them, you know, send the money back because there's quite a few agencies that do things like that for, you know, um, for asylum seekers and refugees. And the rest are just really, really struggling. Um, we'll come back to that because um, there's a whole host of questions. And, you know, it's about survival. It's about if you don't have a bank account, you can't buy a house, you can't buy a car. There's just absolutely yes. nothing. Your hands are tied. Yep. Um, you escape from one prison into another prison, yeah. <laughs> an open air <laughs> yes. prison. But be that is may, let's look at your foundation. What are you doing to help people in those situations? Because I'm sure that is close to your heart. Yes. Yeah, so um, I think it's very important for people to know that I am the exception and not the norm. And because I'm an exception, then I need to use this platform to, you know, to help others. And... A very big thing we say is that you, we need to refuse to be deemed voiceless. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of awareness campaigns. 
um, right now we're moving into the policy change. So, you know, we we approaching government departments and saying this is not right, you know. A very big problem right now is that Home Affairs has refused to reopen uh, refugee reception offices, even though there's a Supreme Court of Appeal order telling them to do so. So there's amazing organizations like Amnesty International who are spearheading that and, you know, um, doing research with refugees and asylum seekers so we try and get we try and get people you know to go and speak out and be part of this research so that their voices are counted um, a lot of us think that it's okay to have our rights infringed so now we need to teach people their rights you know as a refugee and asylum seeker you're entitled to one two three four five um, and helping people to be empowered because when they see an asylum seeker like myself on TV or in the newspaper or on the radio, they realize that I can also do it. They are empowered. Um, so many of us are scared because of, you know, the abuse that we face, like at these re refugee centers. A lot of people don't even want to go to renew their permits because the centers that were closed were the closest centers to them. So now they have to travel like from Johannesburg to Pretoria or from Johannesburg to Musina. And people can't afford those trips. And I mean, if you're a family of five, it's not feasible. So it creates a whole different problem where people are now illegal because they haven't renewed their permits because they couldn't afford to go to the refugee reception office. So. In my opinion, that's an intentional barrier. That is institutionalized Afrophobia. Because if we make it as hard as possible for you, you'll be legal, we can arrest you and deport you, you know? Um, that's how I see it. And this is how it's playing out. Because at the moment, South Africa is deporting more Africans than any country in the world. It is Women's Month. The focus is on women and their rights and the emancipation of women. Do you find the situations that you're coming across, and you're doing lots of work through your foundation, that women are being more marginalized in these areas, you know, when they're seeking Absolutely. any sort of assistance, whether it is through the, um, you know, uh, renewing mm -hmm. permits, trying to find work. Yeah. Um, we also know that refugee and immigrant women are the most vulnerable as far as human trafficking is concerned. What have you come across in all of those areas? Um, well, there's a lot, but I'll mention two for now. The first one would be the treatment of women and children at these ref refugee reception offices. They stand in queues that don't move for up to 10 to 12 hours. There's no baby changing facilities. There's no um, seating area for women with children, the elderly, you know, um, people living with disabilities. Uh, the second big problem is um, access to sexual reproduction health, um, antenatal uh, services, and just health services, you know. Uh, women are being told that they are giving birth too, too often, you know, they're being forced to go on contraceptives. There's also the language barrier, you know, um, reporting sexual abuse. Um, you know, they're turned away because they are not understood. Uh, you know, no effort is made for a translation. Uh, p uh, health professionals are very impatient. And um, yeah, so, so those are the big issues that w a refugee and asylum seeker woman face. Okay, hold that thought. We're going to uncover more of all of those issues and what your foundation is doing and what we as South African citizens can do and should be doing to help you guys along. Still to come on the show, we are going to be talking the great African read, but we're hearing this horror story from Sophie Kanza. She herself is, um, she has been granted asylum more than 20 years ago, she and her family, and she's just been seeing this horrible scenario playing out around her as far as other 
immigrants, asylum seekers and refugees are concerned and she's here to highlight their plight. She's also here to talk about her foundation and how they can make a difference in the plight of those very vulnerable people, very especially women. We are the Muslim Ummah And each day that goes by The harder we try In gratitude we pray to Allah Chosen as part of the best of mankind We spread the word of Islam Spread the word I Spread the word Honda Johannesburg South services from 699 rands. Visit www.hondajhb.co.za. bathrooms and towels be connected to Muslims all around you United Uma is the app that allows you to request for help as well as volunteer your services to assist those around you ask for help look for jobs or services or offer jobs and help those around you register now by downloading our app from paid services to free services this app has it all download it now and be part of the United Uma The death rate in the Eastern Cape of South Africa is 11.9 to every 100,000 children. The Eastern Cape province remains the poorest province with the highest levels of unemployment. Join our drive against malnutrition and death due to starvation. Support our certified empowerment programs designed to free individuals from poverty. Support the Alfida Foundation at www.alfida.co.za or contact us at 041-484-1288. The Alfida Foundation. Close to home, close to heart. Welcome back. I'm talking to Sophie Kanza. She is with the Sophie Kanza Foundation and she just highlighted a few of the atrocities that refugees and asylum seekers have to um, obviously forbear whilst living here in South Africa, never mind illegal immigrants. She spoke about the non existent health care uh, facilities available to refugees and asylum seekers, and I kind of wonder what happens to illegal immigrants? What happens to these people when they go to state hospitals? You've just outlined the difficulties and the challenges that they face when they go to state institutions. Does it mean that illegal immigrants, because they don't possibly have paperwork, are not seen to? Yet on the other hand, local people complain about the overburdening at state institutions, hospitals especially, by illegal immigrants, asylum seekers and refugees. So right now when you go to a state hospital, the first thing they do ask for are your documents. And if you don't have them? You are turned away. So you're not going to get, even if you're dying, even if it's an emergency, they're not going to see to you? If it's an emergency, they will see to you. But um, for clinics and um, that kind of, you know, um, those services, they do ask for your asylum seeker permit. But I must say that it's, it hasn't always been like that. 
uh, as I've said, I've been here for a very long time. So um, let's say maybe 10 years ago, it was not like that. They would help you with It was pretty open. Yes. But then it's also because there has been an influx of, you know, asylum seekers and refugees. And um, so in defense of state institutions, <clears throat> yes. they're turning people away simply because they're overburdened. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. So that's <clears throat> sadly, that's the reality on the continent. You know, right. it's not a South African problem. It's <sighs> a continental problem that there's a refugee crisis. Mm -hmm. yes. Let's understand the word Afrophobia. Um, you're very pained by um, never, never mind. Xenophobia is what South Africans would um, obviously exercise against non-South African citizens out of fear or whatever it is, out of fear, out of hate, out of ignorance. But you have, um, you're very concerned about this notion of Afrophobia. Yeah. Explain it to us. Explain how it plays out in different communities. Yeah. So Afrophobia is a hate or fear centered or rather against African migrants. Or Africans against Africans. Yes. Now, the reason why we prefer to use Afrophobia and not xenophobia is because um, the treatment an American would get and the treatment someone from Ethiopia would get would not be the same. And um, also because when we come here as a refugee or an asylum seeker or a migrant, we are in the same spaces at the locals on a brother to sister type of relationship. So we take taxis, uh, you know, some of us go and stay in the informal settlements where we are now competing for the same resources. And then that's where the Afrophobia persists. Because if, you know, you an American, you live in Santon, you're not competing for the same resources as someone in Alexandra. But if me, as an African, go and live in Alexandra with the locals, you know, they, they see me every day and then... So they do discriminate against you? Yes. Mm -hmm. And possibly even maybe a perpetrate violence on you? Absolutely. Um, so part of our activism is shooting content and short films and speaking to people. And in our latest one, Kumi, Kumi means 10, and uh, 2018 is 10 years since the first um, outbreak of Afrophobic violence where 64 people lost their lives. Um, and we asked children, like, what is a foreigner? And one of the kids said, a foreigner is someone that comes from Africa. So it's, it's a perception that, you know, a foreigner is an African, but a tourist is a European, you know? So that's why I think it's very important to call it what it is, and it's Afrophobia and not xenophobia. You do a lot of awareness campaigns. You also do a lot of fundraising because you're trying to lighten the plight of the absolute downtrodden. Would this be only um, refugees, um, immigrants, etc., or is it for the wider community? So um, we have two two projects. The one is for refugees, asylum seekers, and then the other one is our social cohesion project where we use, um, we use charity work as a vehicle to get people onto our um, projects. So we recruit migrant youth and local youth to work together on different projects. So these are working at orphanages, um, you know, tutoring children, and uh, now those How's benefit. that working out? It works great, it works great. People are very, very interested. And you know, with social media, we are, you know, we get 80% of our volunteers off social media. And that's very clever because what you're doing is that you're breaking down, you're creating relationships between different Africans, yeah. locals and foreign Africans, and you're getting them in a space where they have to interact, yes, understand absolutely. each other and realize, hey, we're no different to each other. Yeah. So and you're breaking down all of those barriers. Yes, and also 
helping their communities that they live in because we've also found that a lot of foreign youth uh, congregate amongst themselves and uh, so that slows down the integration process. So um, yeah, charity work is an amazing vehicle to get all these issues ironed out. Now you spoke about um, fundraising but it must be very difficult for you because you're, um, you're a foreigner and you, if you need to start a fundraise, if you want to approach large corporates or government organizations for funding, that's not possible for you. Why not? It's not possible because, number one, an asylum seeker cannot register an NPO with the Department of Social Development. So a lot of corporates um, and governments need you know an NPO certificate because they need to claim tax and PE etc so um, we we just find ways around it a lot of our volunteers you know work at certain companies and you know they try and get sponsorships for us or you know we we invest a lot of our own money into it uh, so the fundraising that we've done we've done a fashion show which we had uh, refugee designers and local designers working together. So we try and keep the thread of social cohesion in everything that we do. Luckily, we got a venue sponsored. Um, and I must say, individuals have been really, really great in assisting us, both locals and migrants. And um, yeah, so as I said, with social media, we really reach out to people and there yes, are good yeah. people that really do help us out. <laughs> True. Uh, I guess that there are more good people in the world than bad people. Absolutely. And all of the bad experiences that you have uh, shouldn't make you lose faith in humankind. Um, but you've registered, I'm not sure if this is a registered organ uh, foundation or not. You call yourself the Sophie Kanza Foundation. Yes. Um, and because you're a refugee, have you managed to register it? Are you an NPO? What's happening in that space? So we have recently registered as a non-profit company. So the difference between a non-profit company and an NPO is that the NPO register at the Department of Social Development and then they are then um, available or they qualify for government funding. And then a non-profit company cannot get government funding or um, registered through the Department of Social Development, but they are, are registered under the Companies Act, and uh, they do. We do um, qualify for tax exemption. Okay, you've been in operation for a couple of years now. Yeah, since 2014, right. but we did not know about the nonprofit company until this year. So. Four years on, what are your highlights? What have you achieved thus far and what have been the challenges? So our first short film, Singabantu, We Are Human, um, won an award at the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations. Oh, wow. So that really, um, you know, ejected us into the international um, media and we got a lot of attention through that and the plight of asylum seekers was known to many through us. Um, I always say in South Africa, being an asylum seeker or refugee is almost like a secret. A lot of people are, so to say, in the closet. They don't want people to know because of the stigma that comes with it. So when we came out bold, um, we got a lot of attention through that and a lot of people were able to share their stories. And I should imagine lots of financial support as well. Not as much as we would have liked to, but yeah, so a lot of... The attention is great because then the project, more eyes see the project. Um, so I was, okay, we've got a minute to wrap up, so if you could just speed it up for us. Yeah, so I was also chosen as a brand South Africa Play Your Part ambassador, um, so which was great. And then uh, Singabantu, just, it's been seen in four continents, 27 countries and counting. So it's doing really, really well. 
And yeah, so now we're doing the policy change campaign where people are writing letters to Home Affairs. What and how do you want local South Africans to assist you as far as the Sophie Kanza Foundation is concerned? So we're always looking for volunteers to sign up to help with the different projects, either community upliftment or the asylum seeker and refugee projects. Um, you know, food parcels, giving people water while they wait in those queues. That's a project we're looking at starting, as well as helping us to call policy makers to task and ask them to reopen these centres. And that's where we have to leave it. People can get in touch with you on Facebook yes. and other social media yes. platforms. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. And there you have it. If you want to make a difference, this is another foundation you could sign up with. But uh, And you can, of course, visit their um, Facebook pages and uh, make your mark. Let's go for our next ad break. When we come back, we're going to be talking The Great African Read. An-Nur Islamic Center plans to undertake a project which includes building a girls' Darul Ulum. This will further develop our deen in this forgotten area. Be part of the preservation of the Book of Allah by sponsoring this project. Contact An-Nur Islamic Center today on 061-6670-621. Quality, quality, quality. That's what you can expect at Khan's. We select the best cuts. We stock the juiciest, most tender meats. Pre-made meals, making supper a breeze. Customer service that makes you feel right at home. Great quality meat doesn't just happen. So come to Khan's Meat, where service and quality matters. Freeway Toyota, your Toyota dealer that has always provided you with great deals and service. Deal with the people that care. Contact us on 011-661-0000. Everything in life evolves and so should your fitment center. Evolution Wheel and Tire Fitment Center offers you great reliable service at affordable prices. Get more tire deals, get more for your vehicle. Evolution Wheel and Tire, a new dimension in fitment. Call us now on 11 or 3. Life's most persistent, urgent question is, what are you doing for others? A man's true wealth is the good he does in this world. The Mustadafin Foundation feeds 15,000 people a day with your donations to reduce the amount of children who go to bed hungry. How can you help by sponsoring a pot of food at 2,800 rands or sponsor a parcel at 400 rands? The Mustadafin Foundation. If every man helps his neighbor, then who will need help? Welcome 
welcome back. And we have a very bubbly Sne Shabangu in studio with us. She's here to talk to us about the great African reed. And it sounds absolutely fascinating. Let's start off by asking her how she got started. And of course, the NetBank CA training program competition. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Julie. How are you? I'm good <laughs> and good to have you in studio. You so the first me. question, why did you enter that CA, Nedbank CA competition? Okay, so I entered the competition essentially because I really feel like I want to leave a legacy of knowing that I bettered my community. So when it came up, I was like, I have to enter because this is definitely in line with the purpose that I have. And this is why you're studying? Uh, so I'm studying chartered accountancy just to open those channels for me, to open that network for me so I can then fulfill my purpose through it what is it that this competition gives you mm. you know when people enter competitions it's you know what's in it for me yeah. so you do say that you wanted to put back into your community yes, so did. how was that possible so when I entered the competition I was announced third and then they funded wow, me <laughs> thank you it was a national competition so I was third in the country and then they basically funded me and then I took that money to buy books to then start out the spelling bee back then okay the great African read is what we're talking about today, yes. but I also know you have a company called Hamsini Na Ne, mm. and that's quite a tongue twister. <laughs> what does it mean, and how does it tie in with the great African read? <laughs> okay, so it's got a lot of history and background to it, um, but it basically stands, so Hamsini Na Ne is 54 in Swahili, and it speaks to our vision and our goal, because there are 54 countries across the African continent. Wow. Yes, yes. so it's speaks to the fact that we want to change Africa as a whole. It's not just only South African based, but our vision is to then add on and change and improve communities around the African continent. So that is the inception of Hamsini Nane. So and when did you start it? Uh, I incorporated the company in September 2016. Uh, and then, so basically what I do is I launch different projects, initiatives and communities under the Hamsini Nane umbrella. And the Great African Read is our first project under that umbrella. So let's talk about the African read then. Yeah. Um, and I also know that you introduced a spelling bee. Yes. Let's understand your thinking around okay. all of this, the great African read. We are told yes. that um, literacy levels in South Africa are pretty low. Mm. So obviously your thinking was around that. Yes. How did you get all, all of this into motion? Uh, okay, so in 2014, I entered the NetBank CA training program and I wanted to improve literacy. So you have to have an aim, what you want to do. Uh, so I wanted to improve literacy st statistics. And initially I said, how do I make reading and writing fun? How do I do that? And then I thought of a spelling bee, right? And this is part of your entry, this is yes, what you submitted. And this is what I submitted. So I said, how about we get children excited about reading again? We let them read a book and then from that book that they read, they can spell words it's from the book and then that will be our spelling bee so it's like a spelling bee with a bit of a twist and then years later I decide let's launch the writing leg of the competition not only do we want them to write, read but we also want them to start writing so this is like so there are two parts to the great African read where young high school learners are writing books and then primary school learners are reading these very same short stories that are submitted by the high school learners. How many people do you have entering the spelling bee? And obviously because you mm. were funded by the NetBank Challenge, they too had to put checks and balances in place <laughs> to see that you were following through. Yes. Um, so how many people did you target and what was the response like from the communities? It was surprisingly amazing <laughs> uh, so what I did was I partnered with the Newcastle Library Services which is back home where I'm originally from and so with them we were then able to go to over 40 schools around Newcastle um, talking to st students about writing and reading and then in that I think we had over 60 learners from across these different schools so there would be different representatives for each school and some would be like more than one person representing that particular school and the turnout was absolutely amazing we had so many different sponsors involved we were on the local radio stations local newspapers so I think that even surprised me at the time because I read that's 
what I, I told Nedbank that I wanted to do. I wanted to get people excited about reading and writing again. So when I came back years later after I'd finished my honors degree, I was like, now that that's done, I can purely focus on just getting the Great African Read going, where we, both, we focus on both writing and reading. Where did you where did you introduce that, and how are you going to grow the concept? Yes. Um, so I went back to the Newcastle Library Services last year, and I said, I've got this great idea. I want them to start writing short stories as well. And they said, great, uh, but you need to then talk to the Department of Education. So I followed up with the KZN Department of Education, got them involved, and then we earlier this year, we had meetings with, meetings with various principals from all over KZN. Uh, we sat down, we introduced the project, and we asked them if they were interested, then they could take part. And then over the past few months, we've literally just been getting short stories from around the Amajiwa district in KZN. And I think the first time I actually got my first story, I started crying. So I'm like, someone actually took time to actually sit down and start writing a short story to better themselves yes there's an incentive based on winning the competition but to actually just take time and invest in yourself that for me was just so amazing now obviously there's an incentive as you've said yes. and that's get that gets people hooked yes what happens after what are you going to do with all these collection of stories even the people that haven't made the cut perhaps yes are you going to collect the stories into one because essentially what we want to do in the long term is we want to create a book called the great african read so as we are collecting our stories we're just making sure that we can actually compile a book that will then give off as a published book that was written by high school learners across South Africa. And uh, the age groups, are you targeting different age groups? Mm -hmm. So we started out targeting grade 10 learners this year just for the writing competition. And then with the reading competition that will feed off from the writing competition, we are hoping to target grade 7 learners. But I think as the competition grows, we are hopefully going to be able to target other grades as well. The reading competition that you talk yes. about. So these guys, the grade 10, write the books. Yes. The grade 7s read the book. Yes. How are you going to assess them? Would it be through a spelling bee? Yes, it is. Okay. Mm. So there's incentives all around. Yes, they are. Um, now, going forward, what have you... Because obviously there's a backstory to all of, of this course. as well. Mm. Um, what sort of stories are coming out of uh, these kids yeah. writing it? Yeah. You did tell me you're going to combine it into one book, but mm. what is it telling you? I'm sure there are a lot of very heartbreaking stories. Yes. Um, they're putting their lives onto pieces of paper, mm. and a lot of them are crying out for help as mm. well. Yes. I don't know if you've picked that up, and if you have, what are you doing about it? I think, so I'm going back to Newcastle next week to start announcing all the various winners from the various schools, and I think... Initially, I wanted to have like a separate luncheon with just the winners, and then I decided, no, let's take a different approach. Let's go. These children actually want someone to talk to. Because the sort of stories that I've read are stories about belonging, wanting to belong, feeling like an outcast. There's certain stories where you just, you're so connected, and I think that's why I got so emotional. I started crying because I'm thinking, oh my gosh, these children just want to share their life experiences, and I want to connect with that when I go home next week. OK, let's go for an ad break. We'll be back with you in a minute to, to, to continue talking the great African yes. read. And, of course, she's sitting right here. Amazing story. Going around schools all around the country. She started in Newcastle, obviously. Uh, but Snare has a bigger vision, bigger dreams and aspirations for children throughout South Africa. Stay with us. We're going to talk some more to her after the ad break. من نعم الله الجبار قبس من نور المختار وبعزم كالنهر الجاري نسلك درب العلم ونعمل قبس إصلاح وإخاء علم إيمان ودعاء وكانت البئر عميقة in the well was deep why are we saying كانت and not كانت she well is feminine, so it should be kana, but because we own is feminine. The purpose of this course and all our other courses that have to do with the Arabic language is we want others to taste the flavor in the Quran Kareem. 
Imagine the next level in faucet design. Coordinated throughout your bathroom. Imagine the redesign of water itself. Trend, tap and tile, or Mondi. Your home, our passion. Combinators is a place to be, to eat. Combinators is a place when you hungry. When your tongue is feeling funny, and there ain't no food for money, then the place to be is Combinators. For good Italian taste. When nothing goes to waste. For original wood fire to pizza and the pasta. And for a fusion of international taste. <laughs> Visit Cami Nettles and Purple Burger at Overport, Durban City, and now Peter Maritzburg. And for the kiddies, Planet Purple at our Overport store. Cami Nettles now introducing Let's Tie. Keep yourself and the kids happy this winter because we at International Brands Outlet have got you covered. With the dopest brands from polo to Converse sneakers and a whole lot in between to keep you covered winter and summer, IBO will ease you into the office all the weekend in style with a range of products to keep the kids, mom and dad happy. Afford your true self with International Brands Outlet. IBO, affordable quality and style. Islamia College in Cape Town is the largest independent Islamic school in the Southern Hemisphere with five components, pre-primary school, primary school, boys high school, girls high school, his academy, as well as extracurricular sport. There are financial constraints that often prevent worthy students of having access to our institution. With your generosity, we, inshallah, intend to provide an opportunity to as many learners as possible to benefit from what Islamia College has to offer. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and I'm back with you with the very bubbly and energetic Sne Shabangu. She speaks with such passion. It's something that's very close to her heart, the great African Reed. Um, I have to ask you this question, you know, we are human beings and we do have egos. And whenever <laughs> we do something, it's, um, you know, there's got to be something in it for me. Mm. When you entered this competition, what was in it for you? <laughs> it's taken you off on a totally different path, but yes. initially you must have entered it with something. You had your eye on something. What was it? So when the competition started, I think there were... It was an iPad, and oh I just, I wanted an iPad so badly. I was like, you know what, I'll enter the competition. And then it completely rerouted from then, because in that competition, I then found my p purpose and my passion. Wow. You reach the crossroads <laughs> of your life through this competition, yes. and just see where your life has taken you. Completely. Are you happy with the results up to now? Um... I am. It's just I feel like as young people, we constantly just want things to happen immediately. And like literally, I want the competition to grow to an African scale in the next month or so, you know. But I think what I have had to learn over the years is you need to pace yourself. You need to grow at a sustainable rate. And that is what I'm trying to do now. You've been very fortunate because you won the competition mm. and Last you had third. people that yeah. were supporting <laughs> yes. and buying into your dream and your vision. Yes. But surely there must have been challenges on the way and how did you what were they and how did you deal with them um i think when we started out i i wasn't sure how i wanted people to be involved so yes granted we had great sponsors to start off with and i had my partnership with the newcastle library services but i didn't know how i wanted them to then grow this vision with me and I think the more we sat down and we had those meetings and I told them what it is my goal was and we started having the same goal things just it rolled off so well from that 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Going forward, obviously you're going to want to grow this even of bigger course. and better. Mm -hmm. You started out in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. What is your bigger dream and your bigger vision for the rest of mm -hmm. South Africa and possibly even beyond? Africa. I think the ultimate goal speaks to the name of the company. which and is That's why I said 54 countries. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I want to grow it to an African scale, but I'm ready to start it at home. And I feel like we've created such a good home base that it's, it's safe to now start reaching out people because people are excited about the initiative. People, I feel like not enough focus is placed on illiteracy and literacy in our country, and we need to start changing that. We need to get people get excited about what we want to do about literacy across the continent. How are you going to manage and assess mm. the schools that you have already visited? Yes. I mean, you've got big dreams. Yes. You're wanting to go throughout Africa. Mm. But what about support after you've been to yes. a particular district? Mm. You've fired all the youth up. Yes. They enter the spelling bee. Mm. They then go on to write mm. stories. And then the others go on to read the stories. Mm. You are telling them that the possibilities are yes. huge. Mm. But then you move on. What happens to them? Okay. So I think when I was in matric at Hope High School in Newcastle, what I struggled with was I remember a friend of mine and I was sitting at one of the prize givings and we were thinking, I wish there was someone here that could introduce us to these big initiatives that we always see on TV. Because that changes your thinking, that changes your mindset and that changes the dreams that you have for yourself. So imagine me going to an underprivileged school in KZN and I tell them, your dreams are valid. I'm also from this very same school that you are from and look at me now. So I think just planting that seed of just assuring them that everything is going to work out and you can dream bigger than what you see. The stories that you read could just translate to something that turns into your own life. And I think I just want to plant that seed within them to assure them that everything is going to work out and they have to start dreaming bigger than what they see around them. Now, we know that the unemployment uh, yes. rate in South Africa Terrible. is sitting at, what, 27%? Mm. Um, and, of course, the uh, majority of that 20% is comprised of youth. Mm. Um, if they are not, and they are not gainfully employed, mm. um, it just spells trouble, yes. drug addiction, uh, gangsterism, trafficking, etc., etc., etc. Have you looked at that picture, mm. and have you thought of how you can perhaps start working with unemployed youth and perhaps start upskilling them in some way? Mm. Maybe just helping them to read. Yes. I mean, should literacy not also be targeted at them? Yes, I think so. When I did my initial proposal, I think unemployment was a big thing that I highlighted. And I said, imagine people that, because unemployment hits people that are educated with degrees and As honors well. degrees True. and masters. But imagine the person who can't even read and write. Imagine how that affects them, their ability to then be able to change their families and the generations that come after. It's so limited. So how about we start there and we say, let's get you to a level where you can actually read and write. You can, start, you can actually fill in an application to go to a university. You can start writing out a proposal. Those basic things that we take for granted that we can do so easily, some people cannot. And it's heartbreaking because this is 2018 and there are people that cannot do something that basic so I really feel like I want to get young people to sort out like those little basic things that we take for granted I want them to be able to fix that at that level now so because if they don't you're going to get the unemployment unemployed youth exactly. on the corner exactly. so you're trying to start uh, yes. right so let's at the fix beginning the basics first before we even start tackling those issues let's get everybody on the same playing field you have big dreams and a big vision 54 countries is your target <laughs> yes. what is the time span you've given yourself and who are the people that you're hoping to partner with you can't do this on your own I really can't um, I've only accepted this recently the fact that I can't do it by myself because I think as human beings you always feel like you're strong enough and you can but I have a full-time profession like I'm in a profession that requires me to work eight hours a day every you're busy day. doing your articles yes I'm doing my articles um, so now I think sitting down with myself and accepting that I need help especially because I have such a big dream it's now that I need to sit down and decide who I want to be partnering with in furthering this dream and that's like a 
big discussion that I need to have with myself going forward. You do know that the people that you're going to approach, mm. uh, be it government, be it corporate, etc., yeah. uh, they may not buy into your dream. This is mm. your dream. Yes. How are you going to deal with that? And when doors get closed in your face, mm. are you just going to give up and walk away into the sunset? Or how are you going to yeah. persevere? <laughs> Good questions, Julie. Um, but I think I read something actually two weeks ago. And it's because when I started with the Great African Read, because the spell, spelling bee had worked out so well many years ago, I approached different corporates. And it wasn't the same excitement because it's a different approach to what we did in 2014. And I read something two weeks ago and it said, do it anyway. Oh, do wow. it anyway. Do it anyway. Do it anyway. So mm -hmm. I think that is my mantra now. I, I live by that. And I'm like, even if you are not interested, I know what the goal is and I will do it anyway. It reminds me of the starfish analogy. Yes. It made a difference to that one starfish. Mm. Okay, who are you going to partner up with? What is your support system looking like mm. at the moment? I'm, I'm thinking mm. um, friends, family, yes. relatives. Mm. How so, are they supporting you through this? Um, so the KZN Department of Education has been so instrumental because we've been able to liaise with the different schools through them. Uh, SMD Technologies has been sponsoring our gifts for the winners of the competition. Mm -hmm. uh, the Department of Accountancy at the University of Johannesburg is also involved and they've been involved since 2014. And because so that's where you studied. It. Yes, that's where I studied. Um, friends and family, I think even today I told them, please just tune in. I'm going to be on TV talking about the great African read. <laughs> and before I even got on set, they were like, okay, we're watching. So I think just knowing that I have such a great support system reassures me that I'm on the right track. You're going to have to also look, at, you're thinking very big, <laughs> so you have to also think about big partners mm. and big fundraisers. Yes. Have you given thought to that? No, 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 I haven't just yet because I wanted to see how the initial project goes because this is the first time we're rolling out the great African read to a point where people are writing and reading. So I wanted to see how that works out in the Amajuba district and then after that do like a post-mortem and assess what we can do better to get to our final goal. So you haven't come to the post-mortem stage yet? No. But so far are you still happy with the results? I am. I really, really am. Mm -hmm. I have contact people at various schools around the Amajuba district and I just, I think sometimes you have this vision for yourself and when you start seeing people, this coming to life, it honestly, it's such an emotional experience for me. I get so emotional thinking, I was just at home sitting on my bed thinking about, I want to do this and now this is rolling out and it's gotten to a point where it's becoming a reality. People are being affected and they want to develop themselves through something I just came out with. How has this journey changed you, Sne mm. Shabangu? Yeah. Uh, the person you were four mm. or five years ago to the person you are now talking to me? Um, I think what the great African read and literacy as a whole, because I want to improve young people through literacy and exposure, it made me realize that it's not just about me. The purpose is bigger than me. Um, one day I will go to the next life and I want to be able to look back and think, I did that. Wow. I walked away and I changed someone's life. It wasn't just about me. We as women, as girls, are going to be enjoying a wonderful public holiday tomorrow yes. <laughs> in honor of women. Mm. It's Women's Month, it's Women's Day. Mm. Um, we know that women, not only in Africa, but all around the world, are being exploited, yes. trafficked, downtrodden upon, um, are not given access to basic health, basic education, etc., etc., etc. What do you say to those women? What do you say to sisters that are on an equal as you are? Mm. I say, look at the sister next to you and encourage them. I feel like sometimes you just want someone who's gone ahead of you to turn back and just give a kind word. Just give me something to hold on to so you can reassure me that things get better. Because I feel like we've all gone through certain challenges in our lives. And if you can turn back and look at the sister behind you or next to you and affirm them and tell them that things get better because they got better for you, then that changes how they feel about the current challenges that they're facing. People watching us this morning might decide that's the type of person I'd like to partner with or associate with or perhaps volunteer to be um, 
part of her journey. Yes. Is that a possibility and how do they get in touch with you? Um, well, they can find me on social media. Uh, it's Sne underscore Shabangu on Twitter, uh, Sne underscore Shabangu on Instagram. Um, and then they can just also mail me. Uh, it's Sne at hamsininane.co.za. And um, working as a volunteer in your organization is a possibility. Yes, I think when we start rolling out the reading leg of the competition, we'll definitely need people to assist in terms of running the actual competition going forward, especially because I'm, more, I'm based in Johannesburg and the competition right now is based in KZN. Well, I do wish you lots and lots of luck yeah. for the future, for your big dreams. <laughs> I'd like to talk with you in five years' time and see just how much um, of, uh, you know, how much of a difference you've made, mm. not only here but in the rest of Africa, mm. or how far you have gone. Mm. So please hold on to those dreams because it gives other women and girls watching us this morning, mm. it gives them that thread of hope that anything, it's as possible. you said, Anything is possible. Dream it, and it can become a possibility. Yes. Thank absolutely. you for being on the show this Thank morning. Thank you, Julie. I so love to have you on the show. Too. <laughs> have a brilliant Women's Day. Thank you so much. You too. Thank you. That was the very bubbly Snesha Bangu talking about the great African read, and I loved talking to her. She has <laughs> such energy. We have to end the show um, and thank you so much for watching. I do hope you've enjoyed all the interviews as much as I've enjoyed being here for the past hour and a half. Until Saturday, as always, take care. Enjoy tomorrow. It's your day. Make the most of it and get all the men in your life to spoil you rotten. <laughs> Till the next time, as always, it, and of course, a big thank you to my production team. It is Take Care on the Roads and Khodafis from me, Julie Ali. Ya hala 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 hanni qalbi ala jam'at al khair hala hanni qalbi ala jam'at al khair hala ya 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 من نعم الله الجبار قبس من نور المختار وبعزم كالنهر الجاري نسلك درب العلم ونعمل قبس إصلاح وإخاء علم إيمان ودعاء Be part of the preservation of the Book of Allah by sponsoring a Hafiz for only 1,500 rands per month or 18,000 rands per year. Contact the Al Iman Foundation on 011 0302. When it comes to Sharia compliant investments, Al Baraka Bank considers the means as important as the end. Whether you're saving toward a goal, investing in fixed deposits, or seeking investments that provide a regular income, Al Baraka provides you with an investment journey based on purity, trust, and security. Speak to us today. Al Baraka, your partner bank. Claremont VW, establishing